thanks everyone for joining the talk. Looking forward to breaking down a lot here. Um, I'll be, you know, a lot of these slides, I can probably go and talk about them for 30 minutes. I'm gonna really work on being quick and, and exact with them. Um, but quick breakdown about myself, current role, I work at MOX5. Uh, we deal with a lot of uh, different types of ransomware incidents, small to extremely large businesses, um, help them get back up and running from a recovery perspective, but play a lot of different roles um, depending on the incident and, and how we can help get them back to where they were. Uh, previous to MOX5, I didn't, you know, I had no idea that there were so many ransomware incidents out there. It was more on the SecOps side. So, you know, maturing clients' environments, building them up, um, really just didn't have visibility into how impactful ransomware is and how common it is. So looking forward to providing some lessons learned uh, from, you know, the trenches, things that we've seen uh, and get this rolling. So let's jump to the next slide. The agenda today, you know, I'll kick it off with ransomware management. So really painting the picture with the common teams that are involved. Ryan mentioned a bunch of uh, really key players uh, everywhere. Everyone's a part of a ransomware engagement. Uh, typically, you're going to, you know, if you're um, on the applications team, you may be the most critical person to make judgment calls to get your business back up and running. So I'll definitely dig into that a bit, but really a picture of what you should commonly expect when jumping into uh, a ransomware incident within your own business and all the team players that will be involved. Then jumping through some common pitfalls that we see in the trenches, things that you'll want to avoid and uh, make sure that you're staying ahead of. Um, so some of these things are, you know, very, uh, they're surprises until after. So we, we find these through working on a lot of incidents and they seem like they're not big pitfalls, but they've really slid on the process and at, at the end of the day, cost the business a lot of money. And then going to provide a couple of different process and playbook improvements only a couple that you can take away. I won't spend the whole talk talking about how you can create a playbook. And then getting to the meat and potatoes, you know, how can you make sure that you can recover and your business is ready? So talking through some benchmarking techniques and ways you can look at your, your business from a recovery perspective and make sure you're taking the right steps there. And then wrap it up with ransomware resilience. So looking at, you know, what are things that are most common that people do post ransomware? Um, what are some of the common controls? And then also what you should think about moving forward if you're looking at your business and you want to make sure you guys are locked down. So the basic work streams here, you know, want to really just highlight the common ones that come into play. This isn't an exhaustive list, but this will kind of paint the picture for uh, what you may expect to see in a, in a ransomware incident if it impacted your environment. So you're going to have your investigation team really defining the who, what, where, where, uh, when and why, you know, deploying EDR, getting visibility. So this is traditionally going to, uh, most of the time, going to be a third party. So if you have your own forensic team and your own specialists, you guys will want to make sure you know how you can play well with a third party forensic team. What type of evidence can you collect? How can you enable them? And then also making sure, like mentioned in previous talks, you don't want to stomp on any evidence right away. Uh, you want to make sure your techniques also align with uh, what the forensic team is going to do when they get in there. And usually, um, if it's a ransomware case, you're going to probably go a little bit of hands off once a, a forensic team gets in there, especially if you're cyber insurance covered, uh, you're going to have a third party coming in and really kind of taking the lead there. Um, so they're going to triage, identify hosts that are impacted. Um, you know, like mentioned in the previous, previous talks, you want to find the ones that are, you know, kind of bubbling up from an impact perspective, identify ones that have sensitive data on them. And then also, you want to look for um, ones that um, will get your business back up and running. So a lot of people don't think about that, but something you want to prioritize for forensics is, you know, we need to get these systems recovered. So I need to pass these over to the forensic team for them to prioritize. Of course, um, identifying, you know, containment, the what the attacker did is going to be more critical first to get kind of a baseline there, but that's also a really important piece to consider. So other pieces, you know, collect, analyze, report, um, really just touching these at a high level so people have a good pulse on what to expect. Containment, you know, like mentioned, you know, do you, it's a ransom incident. So you're going to take the whole network offline. Are you able to isolate endpoints? Do you have EDR deployed? Um, setting up a segmented VLAN to push those uh, recovered hosts into in a safe manner and have them report out to your um, EDR console and have uh, some protection there. 
And then those tactical blocks, right? So firewall blocks, IDS blocks, those can come into play. And then the recovery work stream. So that's really focused on, you know, neutralizing and expelling the threat actor, getting your environment back up to where it was. So decryption, a lot of people are always surprised at how often decryption occurs. Um, you know, it's very common where you get a decryptor and sometimes it saves you a lot of time uh, with getting the environment back up. And then restoring. So viable backups, can we restore those, get those back up and running? What do we have to actually rebuild? Uh, a comment before I, I saw someone say, you know, those legacy like in the previous talk, uh, SCADA application, SCADA pieces, like legacy applications, sometimes those have to be rebuilt completely. You're not going to have, the, the software company doesn't even exist anymore. And then remediation, cleaning up all the residue, right? So if there's a lot of uh, noise left in the wake of a ransomware incident, a lot of um, files and malicious artifacts that need to be cleaned up. Once forensics is done, you can wipe out all that data. And then from an improvement side, there's going to be a lot of upfront controls that you put into play. You know, you're going to implement some laps most likely and do some AD hardening while you're going through and containing the environment, making sure it's hardened uh, while forensics is ongoing and you're getting it prepped to come back online. But then there's also post, uh, post ransomware where you're going to want to implement even more improvements. So this is a high level breakdown of the different works, work streams. These are really the basic ones to kind of paint a picture with what you, you're gonna expect out there. And then I broke it down in a timeline here so you can help kind of, um, I wanna clear out some, some often confusion with the different work streams and how they overlap. So you have the investigate, contain, recover, and then improve. So you can see I, a lot of people will probably be surprised where they see recovery starting a lot earlier than expected. Um, recovery can start at the same time the investigation starts or really close to it. That will enable the business to be able to turn um, things back on in a fast way once the investigation is complete because re recovery takes a lot of time. So it's a, definitely a much more common thing. I'd say traditionally in the past, people wouldn't think that would be the case. Um, a common pitfall too is, you know, waiting to recover after an investigation is complete. That's just no longer normal and will just cause your business to be down for an excessive amount of time. A big piece here is you want to make sure you have strong containment before recovering. Uh, usually we get a lot of the calls we get are, you know, hey, we started recovering, we got re-encrypted. What happens then, right? You're going to have re-encryption in your backups. You're going to have re-encryption on your domain controller. That, that adds days or weeks to your recovery time. So, making sure you do the proper containment steps uh, in coordination with forensics. So making sure you have confidence that the threat's neutralized and recover at the same time, but make sure you're in a segmented VLAN that, you know, that is a clean network essentially where you're safe to build up the network. And then you have high confidence that you have good controls there in monitoring and defense. So, Another piece here that I would want to highlight is you want to make sure core recovery, core recovery is completed before you start improvements. You know, everyone would be surprised, but you see people ordering thousands of laptops, thousands of monitors, new servers, transitioning to new cloud environments um, all the time, way, almost really early on in the incident. So those, those really bad decisions end up costing the team a lot of time, uh, adding a lot more cost, you know, especially if you're you have cyber insurance, they're not going to cover those type of improvements. So a lot of things come into play there. So complexity factors, I'll talk about the timeline traditionally, uh, not traditionally, but typically, you know, this to get to the full recovery stand uh, point at the bottom right, that's going to be 80 days. So it really depends on the size of your environment, the impact, how evidence is collected, how fast you're able to get confidence and containment, and how you're able to recover. But you know, it's not the 24 hours that everyone wants to, to kind of shoot for, which I'll talk about in a bit as well. So I did a quick breakdown. So this kind of ties back to, uh, I think that something that Ryan was mentioning with, you know, what are the different teams involved? Yeah, we, we see a lot of benefit in having an incident management layer. So that could be your business, having somebody at the top where they're going to you know, take notes, the simple things that really add a lot of value, take notes, um, prioritize what the board needs to know, or um, preferably most of the time the executive team. Um, so what we usually do is we run these cases and we'll have an incident manager who will be running the project management piece of the whole, um, whole engagement. You know, what do forensics 
where where are we at with forensics? Where are we at with negotiations? Where's recovery? Um, it's definitely helpful. We see a lot of value out of it. And then coordinating with insurance, letting them know decisions that are being made. That lets everyone focus on their strengths. You have your executive team on the client side able to focus on, you know, what do we need to prioritize for recovery? Are we um, taking the right steps from a business perspective? Enables everyone to work in their swim lanes really well. So I would say take take a look at your program and look at how you can, you know, in a case of a crisis, who are the people that are going to take those roles and create a customized ransomware playbook just for these situations. And then look at how you're going to leverage third parties and implement that into your playbook. So on that note, there's a lot of parties that are engaged, right? So this is an example of a 1,500 employee company. You got uh, your executive team, which could be, you know, anywhere from two to four, could be commonly 10 people, um, CEO, CTO, CFO, CISO, you name it. Technical team, you know, anywhere from, and this, this scales up too, right? So you're going to have your server, your server team, everybody on the infrastructure team, applications team involved, uh, privacy council, forensic team. So those are more of the third parties, privacy council, forensic, security operations, negotiations, recovery, data recovery cyber insurance. So this easily adds up. You know, a lot of people will, will think until they run into a ransomware incident that it's just going to be my internal SWAT team. It's going to be our, you know, we have a reverse engineer on the team. We have someone that's really good at analyzing logs. Like we got this. We're going to tell everyone what they need to do. It, it's not how it plays out. There, You need to make sure you have your internal roles defined and then also leverage their third parties to their strengths as well. So a big thing too is looking at where and when it makes sense to really lean on a third party. Um, I would say always having a third party forensic team brings in a lot of value. They're gonna have experience in what the threat actors typically do, what to look for, how to expedite the analysis. Um, and if you have you know, cyber insurance, it's gonna play a big factor into how your coverage is, is um, considered. And then you know, look at having a third party run incident management or lean on the teams that deal with these every day. You know, don't try to take everything into your own hands. You know, I've seen commonly where clients will start doing negotiations uh, before engaging privacy counsel, forensics, you know, recovery. Uh, those go, um, those are fun to see, but not good for the client, right? You're on a timer. You know, once you start negotiations, if you don't start, um, you know, you're on a timer at that point, they're gonna start pushing you for um, payment, so you got to make sure you have teams that are, know how those work streams go and that, that are good at it. So, you know, map out these different responsibilities in your own playbook, even though you're not accountable for them. Know, you know, what's involved with negotiations? What are the little, um, the little notes that I need to know to make, make sure the executive team, the technical team, everyone understands how that plays out. So definitely build those into your playbook and make sure everyone knows how that plays out. And there's always around four to five work streams going at one time. So uh, it's really like really controlling the chaos there, kind of leaning back into what I was saying with incident management, having a project manager over all the teams that can provide and make sure everyone's focused in the right swim lanes. Uh, so jumping into kind of an incident management overview, uh, you can see there's a lot of different overlap between the work streams, right? So forensics, they're going to help a lot with containment, even on the first call, you know, you're going to want, you're going to get a lot of guidance of, did you break off your, you know, your backups? Are they still on the domain? Um, did you take down the network that has ransomware spreading in it? Did you reset any passwords? So a lot of that stuff will happen, you know, when the, within the first couple hours when talking with the teams, the guidance that you need, there's a lot of over, overlap between the teams where, you know, recovery will take on a lot of the containment steps as well. Look at different ways to, to lock down the environment and secure it and bring it back in a safe manner. So, um, and the recovery team may have more access than forensics, right? They're deploying EDR. They're not getting into the actual domain controllers. So often uh, on the recovery side, you're going to have your recovery engineers letting the forensic team know we've seen these malicious GPO changes or we've seen... Um, these extensions on these hosts. So it's really a team effort, not only between your internal team, but the third parties that are working on the engagement with you. So really wanted to highlight these. I don't want to get into, I could talk about the slide for, for a while, 
Uh, the big ones that surprise people are probably data mining, right? So if you get impacted, you know, a straight question to most of the audience, you know, do you guys know where your sensitive data is? If not, you know, those notification timings really creep up. So you're going to have to have a quick way to find where that data lives. Something that most people don't think will be part of a ransomware case or help desk support. You know, you're um, resetting everyone's password. You're going to have to uh, um, coordinate between all the end users and make sure they know how to get back in. So setting up a temporary help desk is definitely very common. So these are just some of the different um, pieces that can occur in a ransomware case. I would say the big part of it is having a team that has seen these and has knows how to innovate and knows when to bring in the right teams um, really reduces the noise and makes sure that makes sure that you're focusing on the right part at the right time. So to jump over to recovery pitfalls. So uh, some scary numbers on the right here. Uh, normal excess spend is average around 500,000, you know, on the high side, excess spend can be up over $5 million. So these types of costs are, you know, additional downtime, additional hardware purchases that need, didn't need to be uh, paid for. And these are from our, you know, the data that we collect on our side from actual cases that we've worked and ways that we were able to, you know, adjust the focus and, and minimize the cost and expedite the process. So common danger zone in most ransomware cases are right after you start doing forensics and start collecting evidence, people start, you know, stepping on evidence, they start making really crazy purchases, you know, everyone wants to be helpful. Um, and they're kind of just going, you know, if you don't have somebody controlling the chaos, they kind of go off in their own direction. So, you know, stopping on forensic evidence, that's going to extend your recovery time by weeks, because you're going to have to wait for uh, forensics to get additional evidence and there may be they may have to follow a slower process um, even sometimes you know you may have to decrypt uh, servers to get evidence or you may need to you know you have to get creative with those situations so nonetheless i would say watch out for that danger zone and just keep out for some of these pitfalls so first one you know throwing all resources at a problem it's not uncommon for I've been on calls with three CEOs on a call. Um, you know, you don't want to, you want to make sure you're bringing in the key players and not um, making something, making an environment where people can't react and perform their job. So if you bring in executive teams with a bunch of technical resources, you know, they're not going to say anything. You're not going to get any momentum. There's going to be conflicts there. So that really ties back to your playbook and actually testing and knowing who, who from a data governance is going to be or who from a uh, incident management piece is going to be involved. Quick purchases of hardware, you know, mentioned before, I see UPSs, laptops, um, monitors, you name it, the people will just go out and buy things in, in an incident. They'll just go over, you know, I'm sure Best Buy makes a lot of money from ransom. I know for a fact, they make a lot of money from ransom incidents where people just, you know, drive over, buy a bunch of things and um, feel like they're kind of moving the ball forward. But really, sometimes it's just not the right decision. They could have used existing hardware. It could have really improved the process. And then distracted by squeaky wheels, right? You know, sometimes businesses will just take the, the network and bring it back online too early. Then you're going to get a bunch of help desk requests. You're going to be working with end users more. You have to make sure that you're bringing the environment back up in a way that it's not going to be distracting to your team. So high level. A biggest way to kind of minimize these pitfalls is prioritize and execute. Focus on tier one applications and servers to get the business back up and running. Limit the vendors you bring in. You know, we've seen engagements where there's three forensic providers on there, you know, conflicting with different um, pieces of their pieces of the puzzle, you know, one doing hard disk forensics, one doing, um, you know, pulling basically different work streams that, that are contradicting. And we've seen on the recovery side too, where you have MSP, two different recovery teams, you know, everyone has an opinion and it's just moving the ball in different directions. So limit the vendors you bring in, make sure you know what their focus is going to be and prioritize what you need recovered. And then understand the level of effort it is going to be when you bring those teams on because they could really go down a down a kind of a negative path there quickly. 
and to talk about business impact to really kind of hone in and why you want to avoid those pitfalls, you're already running into a lot of costs from a business side. So there's really um, no reason why you want to extend that cost. The first one is business interruption, um, business interruption downtime. 90% of the time, you're going to be down for five days. So that's going to be something that you're already going to be chewing up from a business side. And then also another piece is you, the connectivity between you and your clients. A lot of businesses will have these connections to you know different businesses that they they have site to site network connections to or trusts with. You know, once your business is impacted, they're going to just break those connections and you're going to have to validate and show them that you're at a point where you've eradicated the threat actor. You've taken a lot of really good proactive steps. So a good example is, you know, a sports franchise, you think NBA, NHL, NFL, you know, you're going to those if a team gets impacted, they're going to be disconnected from, you know, the NHL, for example. Um, think about that from a business side. What are the dependencies you have? Where what are your lines of businesses and how long can you handle that connect? connection being down. Uh, brand impact, you know, there's some threat actors that are posting data immediately. It's not coming down to negotiations. In the past, people could say, you know, brand won't be impacted because we're going to pay the ransom. It's not the case anymore. There's the threat actors will find new ways to make sure you pay. And we've seen recently a lot of threat actors just, you know, posting that they've breached the environment immediately. And then now even posting it on public sites versus, you know, um, that anyone can access to make it easier for everyone to see. So another piece would be incident costs, like mentioned, all the different teams you're bringing in, the forensic work, the recovery work, all the, you know, it's not going to be, uh, even if you have cyber insurance, you're not going to have full coverage, for most likely. There's going to be a lot of different teams, a lot of costs that you need to take into consider there, consideration there. And then post-incident regulatory and compliance fees, I'll be stepping through a couple slides there just to hit on that. And then post resilience, like I mentioned, you kind of look at, uh, you know, how do you get your environment back up and running? And then what do you need to do after to really uh, mature your environment? So kind of immediate carting steps and then long-term improvements. So to step through some of the fines, I won't spend too much time on this slide. I it was kind of shocked to me when I saw this come out you know, your business is already impacted, you're dealing with these situations, and then a couple of years later, you're still dealing with payments and settlements. So these aren't necessarily ransomware cases, but most of the time, ransomware cases, there's exfil. And there's, of course, you know, um, that creates a lot of penalties, fines, and settlements, situations that come out of that. So this is really highlights what the long-term cost could be, where, you know, you see Equifax and Anthem and Home Depot, different companies that are paying these fees years later. And then, you know, not to, and back to my resilience point, some of these teams have now the most advanced cybersecurity teams, in my opinion, out there. So that it's a big cost that the business will take on long-term. And uh, to jump through some of the common pitfalls in relation to cyber insurance. So panic purchases that don't increase recovery time, talked about the monitors, switches, laptops. You know, if, if you purchase something, Think about if it's going to actually improve your recovery time. If it's not, um, and it's not something that was impacted by the incident, you know, that's not going to be covered by cyber insurance at the end of the day. And then opportunities to leverage the insurance policy. On the other side, there's a lot of companies that do a lot of really um, quick recoveries because they're leveraging their insurance policy to its fullest. You know, if you're looking at uh, data mining classification for notifications, rental storage, transitioning to cloud services to expedite recovery. There are some really neat ways that you could lean into your insurance policy if you know what, what it's built around and how you can leverage it to expedite recovery. So ask yourself, does this expedite recovery? Was this impacted? Does my policy cover it? And then assuming coverage, uh, this is a common problem we see in a lot of situations where the client will hear a recommendation and they'll just take it and run with it in a different direction. And they think that, you know, once I get to the coverage portion, I'll just tell, I'll tell the insurance company that, you know, the panel team, they told me to do this. Um, it's, uh, it's very common. And um, yeah, uh, sometimes it's assumed coverage of, we heard them say this, so we think it's going to cover all these things. So be careful with assuming coverage. 
and then track the why, you know, your house burns down, you rebuild it, you know, identify why you made certain decisions and how they were impacted to help you on the back end of your claims. So a big call out there. Um, it's, you know, often see people just kind of making quick decisions and then it's a lot harder on the back end to really look at why you made those decisions. To pivot over to playbook must-haves. So I know mentioning in the beginning of the talk, wanted to just talk through some quick wins that you really should take away and look at applying to your existing playbooks or just having in general. So prioritize asset list. You know, I wouldn't say, you know, everyone says uh, asset inventory. Yes, definitely need that. But first start off at least knowing what you would restore if you're impacted with a ransomware incident. Know who the application owner is, the dependencies, how you would order the restore. That's the first thing we ask for when we get in from a recovery side. And if we have that up front, that's going to expedite our pro like the recovery piece of it. But then also the forensic team will know we need to look at these servers and these hosts first. So then we can say that they're clean or good to go, or we have the evidence, you can rebuild it. Um, it really helps expedite recovery. And then communication governance, like mentioning, you know, having three CEOs, having people that aren't sure of their role in the process creates a lot of challenges. So make sure you just have it documented of who are the people that are responsible for each piece and what's their role in it and how do, are they briefed? Do they know how they're going to take this on? And then back to the previous slide, cyber insurance. Understand the coverage, how you're going to use it, when you're going to use it. And then recovery tactics, you know, keep it simple. You know, focus on how do you get to A to B the fastest way possible. So prioritize the objectives that will get the business back up and running. You know, achieve containment, restore and rebuild Active Directory, rebuild 10 critical servers. You know, focus on that, that quick um, path there to get your business back up and running and just identify how you can get there quicker. So do we have viable backups? Do we need to consider buying a decryption tool? Do we need to rebuild it? So a lot of the time people will kind of get hung up and not make a, make a decision. So make a, make a decision and move with that process to make sure you're expediting the recovery. And a big piece here is there's no technology. A lot of people try to look for a quick win. You know, technology solve all problems. There's no technology that will just enable you to recover quickly. If you don't know, if you have the best backup solution in the world, but you don't know what you're going to recover and you don't have a space to recover, it's getting you nowhere. So also on a playbook, I know it was mentioned a couple of times today, you know, policies and playbooks, they're great, but if you don't know how to use them, you know, what, what's, it's not going to help you day of the attack. They look fancy. Um, you can, you know, throw them out to the team. How, day of, everyone will be surprised, but if they don't know how to use it, it's not going to help you get to where you need to be. Here's a, a breakdown of a recovery example that we actually went through. Uh, this is a, a real example, um, just to kind of paint the picture. I know I talked about the recovery timeline, but to hone in on the different pieces and how it can play in. So threat actor gets in on a Sunday. You know, usually threat actors have access to environments for much longer. They exfil data. You know, of course, it is very common also for security tools to silently fail or not be deployed completely. Um, a lot of people do try to do everything right and still run into ransomware. So um, it's it's really crazy to see the different situations out there. But another talk, another day. Um, so anyways, uh, data exfil on a Thursday. Conti is deployed on a Friday. Forensics and IR are engaged on a Saturday. You know, within 48 hours, EDR is fully deployed. Uh, recovery team starts to restore critical servers. So had a good list of the servers that needed to be re restored. Forensics was engaged. They were really good at doing containment quickly. Um, from there, forensics really identifies persistence quickly and the different footholds the attacker has in the environment. You know, Cobalt strike on 40 systems. By Wednesday, you know, we had the on the forensic side, the attacker was contained, eradicated, and then critical business operations were restored with high confidence. So that's a really fast timeline. That's the preferred timeline. And that's still longer than what a lot of businesses can, can sustain. So you can see at the bottom, completed for forensic investigation on the Sunday, general businesses operations, business operations restored, and then to the end, you know, customer environment normalized after incident. So that's just an example of a timeline to make sure you kind of can piece together the different, some of the key pieces that will happen 
uh, during forensics and during recovery. And this, this is kind of a breakdown of overall, you know, time to um, build a backup a, a network and where, where the forensic piece comes in and recovery. So normally it's going to be 80 days. You can see up in the beginning with the, the red line there and the blue line, there's a big peak for the red line where, you know, um, that's where recovery really started to get engaged in containment. And then on the, on the front side, forensics got in there and really started um, collecting evidence and, and kicking that off prior. So you can see within the first three weeks, those are kind of the, the sprint mode essentially where a lot of teams are kind of all hands on deck. And then after those three weeks, you know, the business is preferably up and running and things fade down, um, trickle down from there. So this is a, a nice visual visualization to show kind of, you know, even after that point, there's still going to be additional forensic um, collection. There's still going to be additional remediation that needs to occur. All right, so this is probably the, my favorite slide of this presentation. Um, back to that point, you know, everyone wants to get back up and running in 24 hours. However, there's a lot that goes into it. You know, uh, in the chat, somebody mentioned uh, people are co commonly looking at RTOs and RPOs of how can we get, how fast do backups work? There's a lot more to consider in a ransomware incident. So the first piece you would want to look at in your environment, how fast can you segment backups? You know, the average is actually one to three days. So this, these numbers are very ballpark uh, numbers because every environment changes. But um, the commonly what we see, that this is what it turns out being. So segmenting backups, goal is 30 to 60 minutes. Average can be from, you know, one to three days, depending on the size of the environment. Blocking traffic, simple process normally. I've seen a lot of um, environments struggle with that. So they can't actually put in the blocks they need because of, Somehow the way their network was configured, a big, um, not a fun challenge to run into, but you know, that's something that should happen in 30, 60 minutes. It takes normally a lot longer. So that's a lot of time to, to kind of sit while your network's still in line. Isolating endpoints, you know, should be able to do that pretty quickly, ends up taking a lot more time. Enterprise password reset, same thing there. And then tier one recovery, mapping out priority assets, setting up a VLAN. Um, assessing backups, restoring tier one assets from backups, forensic appro approval, move to production. So these are a lot of things in addition to looking at how fast you can back something up from a disaster recovery or business continuity perspective. You need to then push the ransomware flavor into that mix and look at, you know, what are the other pieces that we're going to have to do to get back up and running and how can we tackle those? So I would just say, take this list and kind of go back and look at where you would line up to really understand you know, is the business happy with this? If not, you know, most likely 90% of the time they're not going to be. Um, so how can we get it to a point where we know what needs to be restored and how fast it will take? And then to talk about some quick wins to, to think about pre-incident, right? So first, build resilient backups and avoid leveraging tape backups. There's also some um, chat in the summit today about, you know, on the man manufacturing side, it is definitely common for people to have tape backups, and it's common for tape backups to not be impacted. But at the same time, you can you know you can um, transition away from tape backups and still have strong backups in play that will be faster to recover from. So recovering from a tape backup takes a long time, and you're limited to how many readers you have. You have a lot of constraints there, so that really slows down the process. You know, it's nice to have backups, but I would say let's do it in a faster way. And then make sure they're off the, your backups are, you know, your backup accounts are not domain accounts. People can't just, you know, if they're going to get domain admin, they can't pivot to your backups and do a hard delete and that they're constantly patched. We see some of the best environments out there where they had, you know, perfect backups. And then the threat actor found one was, you know, vulnerable. Once they got in, they then did a hard delete. Another thing to call out here that a lot of people don't realize is data recovery is we've had a lot of success with it. So Sometimes, depending on how your backups are deleted, you can go the data recovery route. It will take a while, but some applications are really uh, cost businesses millions. So it's worth that, that time frame and recovery um, of those applications. And then ensure your storage utilization doesn't go over 60 to 70%. That's a big ask. A lot of teams don't 
don't necessarily do that. But if you have excess storage, then you're going to be able to recover your environment very fast. You're going to be able to set up a segmented VLAN, get your tier one assets in there while the forensic team is getting into the environment. That's really a common way we're able to get environments back up and running quickly. And then identify how fast and how slow you can create a segmented VLAN and carve out space. So kind of do a practice run, see it where, where would you store the data? How would you get it back up and running? Could you build up a new DC quickly? Uh, where would you pull the, you know, different data points from? What are the dependencies for certain applications? So, you know, kind of test run that. And then RMM, we found that's pretty helpful for a lot of environments just because there's not a lot of different ways. You know, of course, if you have certain tools deployed, it's going to provide a big advantage there. But knowing your assets, where they live, being able to install software, preferably not letting the R, you know, the threat actor have access to the RMM is nice, but uh, we found it really does help expedite recovery. Then it's one last thing we have to do when we get into the environment is push out, you know, RMM and different tooling. And then last but not least, uh, service accounts. A lot. Of, this is a nightmare when jumping into ransomware cases that, where there's a lot of service accounts with administrative privileges. You're not going to bring up the network when those exist. So there's going to be a long exercise. I've seen it go day, a couple of days to map those out and actually get them back to where they should be. I would really say look at a PAM solution, start getting those consolidated, and, and this will really help if you do run into a fire here. And then to talk through some quick resilience items. So a lot of mention of playbooks, leverage lessons learned, step through tabletops, and then keep updating those, those playbooks. That's a, it's a big win. Um, not only it just educates the broader team on different responsibilities, different tasks, but it, it, it's really something that should be recycled and improve, improved consistently as threats change, as ransomware changes. And then Look at critical controls that are missing from your environment and take them a lot more seriously. Um, you know, some simple ones that a lot of people run into in these ransomware cases is not having AD hardening, PAM, EDR, backup segmentation, vulnerability management, you name it. Um, and even if you do have them, really assessing them and making sure that they're properly configured and battle testing them as part of your playbook process. And then continuous testing, so pen testing, tabletops, purple teaming, and, and feedback loops. And to close it out here, some quick closing notes. Um, you know, set up a process to identify top, top, top priority applications, assets that need to be recovered. Like mentioned, you know, set up some benchmarking around those, see where you're at. Deal with teams that run into ransomware consistently. You know, reach out. There's a lot of different people part of this conference that deal with these uh, incidents a lot. So reach out, get advice, learn, learn from things that they've been bumping into. And then utilize cyber insurance. You know, it's uh, something that can provide a lot of value. The costs are ex paying it out on your own is excessive. So look at if it makes sense for your business. 